Amen. Thank you so much, choir and orchestra and T.C. Chambers. Please open your Bibles this morning to the gospel of, or rather, the book of Ephesians, chapter number 5. Ephesians, chapter number 5. And do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? Or do you take this man to be your lawfully wedded husband? For richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, for better, for worse. Now, why do we say for better, for worse? Why are those words in there? Because when you get married, you're really not sure. Am I marrying better or am I marrying worse? I'm not really sure who I'm going to marry because you think you know that person, but you really don't. And marriage is filled with surprises. Some are great surprises and some are not so great. And when you get married, sometimes you find out, I didn't even know this guy. I didn't even know her and I got married. And you just feel like you're living with a stranger. You feel like you dated Jekyll and you married Hyde and you really don't know who in the world this is. I mean, how could you know that person like you thought you knew them? How did you know that he snores and it's like 6.5 on the Richter scale and the whole house is shaking? How did you know that she, she bites her toenails in bed? You couldn't have known that. And you see, that's why those words are in there for better, for worse. Because you don't know if it's going to be better or it's going to be worse. But whether it's better or whether it's worse, I promise you, according to the word of God, you can still have a great, great marriage. It takes both the husband and the wife, but listen carefully, primarily the husband. Primarily the husband. I want you to listen to these words. Gary Smalley said this. If a couple has been married for more than five years, any persistent disharmony in their relationship is usually, not always, but usually because of the husband's lack of understanding and his failure to apply genuine love. That's usually the problem. Last night I, I read that to Paul and I said, Paul, I want to know, do you really agree with that? Well, that was a silly question. I mean, before, before I got the words out of my mouth, absolutely I agree with that. And really I do too. And I think the word of God emphasizes that. That when the husband and wife stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ, I believe primarily he is going to give an account for that marriage. He is primarily responsible. And it's responsibility for him to make sure that marriage is what God wants it to be. And I cannot imagine talking three Sundays about marriage without looking at this critical passage in that she, be, she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Let's pray again just for a moment. Father in heaven, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for the privilege of being a husband. And I thank you for all of the marriages in this room. And I thank you for everybody who's not married. And God, I just pray that no matter what our situation, you would take the word of God and apply it as only you can to our hearts. So help us to listen with the ears of our spirit. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Now, in Ephesians 5, Paul is addressing both the wife and the husband. But I really do believe he is emphasizing the role of the husband in this passage. So, husbands, I want you to kind of perk your ears up and listen real carefully. Don't tune out. Just try to hang in there and try to endure it, okay? But what does he say to the husbands if you're going to have a great marriage for better or for worse? In the first place, husbands, for better or for worse... Accept your role as the leader. Accept your role as the leader because that's exactly who you are in the marriage. You are the leader. 
Look at verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, that's very plain and very clear. But here's why. Verse 23. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Did you see that? Wives, submit to your husbands. Why? Because the husband is the head of the wife. He does not say because the husband should be the head of the wife. He does not say because the husband should try to be the head of the wife, or the husband ought to be the head of the wife, or it would be a good thing if the husband were the head of the wife. That's not what he says at all. Look again at verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. Men, that is a statement of fact. You are the head of your wife. You are the head of your family, whether you accept it or not, whether you agree with it or not. Whether you act like the head or not, you are the head in the eyes of God. That is the role God created for you, and that is the role that God put you into the day you got married. You accept that role. And you see, if you and I do not accept that role as a leader, even though we are the leader, here's what happens. Your marriage becomes a team with a coach, but he won't coach. Your marriage becomes like a classroom with a teacher, but she won't teach. What kind of a classroom would that be? Your marriage becomes like a ship that has a captain, but but he won't be a captain. He won't captain the ship. In other words, your marriage is never going to be what God designed it to be. God designed marriage. I didn't, and you didn't. God did. I believe he designed marriage before eternity, before the world was ever created, in the back part of eternity. And God created your marriage and you and your wife and your husband and your children in the foreknowledge of God. And I believe God is saying, man, you got to accept that role that I have given you. I want to ask you something, men. If you are not accepting that role as the leader, why not? Why not? Is it because you didn't have a good example? And I believe sometimes that's it. Your daddy did not accept his role as a leader. And you really never saw it. You don't know what it looks like because he did not accept that role. Or maybe on the other hand, your dad was intimidating to your mom. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open to John John 21. If there's ever a guy that dealt with failure, it's Peter. This passage of scripture picks up after Jesus has been crucified. He's risen from the dead. He's shown himself to the disciples and a handful of other followers twice. And now Peter and the disciples decide to go fishing. Well, Jesus isn't with them, at least to their knowledge. And in verse number three, look what happened. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. That should resonate with lots of fishermen in the room. Verse four. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach. Remember, these guys are in the boat, but Jesus is on the beach. But the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellows, have you caught any fish? This is one of the neat things about scripture. When you see Jesus encounter people, he has a way of asking questions. You look through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When he has a conversation with someone, he asks questions And the questions are used for us to acknowledge our current reality. Now, some people decide to hide, but here he is asking a question to these fishermen, and he's wanting them to acknowledge their failure as fishermen. Jesus asks questions throughout Scripture. How about the woman at the well who had been married five times, and now she was living with a man that wasn't her husband? Jesus said, why don't you go get your husband and bring him here? It's a question that's dumb. Or to the disciples as they were talking back and forth about who was the greatest and who'd be the greatest in Jesus' kingdom. Jesus asked them as they approached him, hey, what were you guys talking about on your way coming to me? Or to the religious Pharisees, he would say over and over, did God not say? And remind them in passages of scripture. Because what it would do with those questions, they would always have a sting. The questions were given so that we would have to acknowledge our failure. And that's exactly what Jesus does to the fishermen. So they don't know it's Jesus and he's screaming from the shore. Fellas, have you guys caught anything? He called out, have you caught any fish? 
they replied, no. Now, this is remarkable. Fishermen that decided to be honest. No exaggeration. Just a simple answer. It was straightforward and upfront. And that's what Jesus wanted. Now, I imagine if I were them and I'd fished all night and hadn't caught a fish, and I heard this stranger from the shore ask us if we'd caught any fish, and we said no out loud, I imagine like them, I would have probably thought this, who in the world is that? Don't you mind your own business? I mean, leave us alone, weirdo. I mean, I imagine that's their thoughts. But he continues, and with the next statement, verse 6, look what happens. Then he said, the voice said, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll get some. So they did. And they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. It started to dawn at this moment on the disciples who that voice belonged to. They'd seen this happen before. They knew who the voice belonged to. They knew something amazing had just happened. Verse 7, Then the disciple Jesus loved, who is John, then the disciple that Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. It's the Lord. You know, I was talking about maybe the keys or a car seat or bulletin or a diploma or a baby or a song. Things in all of our lives that when you see it, when you hear it, it reminds you of your biggest faith. Failure. The moment right here that John says to Peter, hey, that voice it's the Lord. I guarantee that Peter's reminded of his greatest failures. And all of a sudden, his failures come front and center throughout this entire chapter. You know the fa- failures that haunt you and me at night, those things that we think no one else knows about, maybe just the family know about, maybe just a close those friends, maybe those things that we could never get past. How do you deal with them? They're front and center for Peter. Because Peter right here is reminded of Mark chapter 5, the first time that he was in a boat and Jesus asked him to push out the shore so Jesus could communicate to a large audience. And then Jesus told him, if you'll remember in that same passage, that he should cast the nets to the other side because they hadn't caught any fish. And Peter spoke up and corrected him and said, hey, listen, We're the fishermen. You're the teacher. We fished all night. I didn't catch a thing. It's the hottest part of the day. No one catches anything at the hardest, hottest part of the day. Why don't you speak, stick to speaking? We'll do the fishing. But instead, they decided to entertain him and they threw the nets off the side. And sure enough, they pulled A net full of fish. And what was Peter's response because of his failure of not trusting Jesus? He ran to the side of the shore, threw himself at the feet of Jesus, and said, Lord, I am a sinful man. I didn't trust you. God, forgive me. God, I don't have any, I have no reason to come before you. And all of a sudden, here in John 21, when Peter hears from John, it's the Lord, and he has this net. full of fish, mine goes immediately back to failure. Failure number one. Well, the good thing that Peter does with this failure is something that a lot of us don't do when it comes to us remembering past past failures. Sometimes what we do is we decide to hide. But at least in this moment, Peter doesn't. He's inspired to run towards Jesus in light of the past failure. So what does he do? Look at the next passage. Verse 7, part B. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, 
trip for work, he jumped into the water and headed to shore. And just got one failure past him because he remembered the last time that Jesus told him to cast the nets to the side. All of a sudden, guess what? Failure number two. He's reminded. The moment he dives off the edge of the boat, his feet touch the water. You know he goes underwater. He thinks back to the last time this happened. The last time was in Matthew chapter 14. There was a storm and the disciples were on the boat. And they were scared to death and they saw what appeared to be a ghost walking on the water. And it was Jesus. And Peter spoke out and said, Jesus, if that you command me to come to you and walk on water, and I will, and that's exactly what happened. And the moment Peter stepped off that boat in Matthew 14 and he touched the water, he started to walk, and everyone saw it. But before long, the waves distracted him. The lightning and the thunder scared him, and he took his eyes off Jesus and he started to sink. And Jesus reached down and grabbed his hand. And once again, Peter was eat up with failure. Because he'd taken his eyes off Jesus. Isn't it crazy how failure tends to come up at the weirdest times? Things trigger our failure. Story continues. Verse number eight. The others stayed with the boat and they pulled the loaded net to the shore. For they were only a hundred yards from shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them. Fish cooking over a charcoal fire. Please pay close attention there. John, the author of this book, includes an incredible detail. Peter swims to the side of the shore, and Jesus is cooking over a charcoal fire. He's preparing fish at breakfast time. Now, If you're Peter, if I'm Peter, what I'm going to do the moment I get to that shore is first thing first, I'm going to dry off because I'm wet. And probably because it's a little chilly and I'm wet, I'm going to get close to that charcoal fire. I see that Jesus already has some fish on the fire. And I begin to look, like Peter, into that charcoal fire. And Peter begins to think about a few weeks late, a few weeks earlier, the last time he stared into a charcoal fire. John 18 says it this way. Simon Peter followed Jesus as did another of the disciples. That other disciple was acquainted with the high priest. So he was allowed to enter the high priest's courtyard with Jesus. This is the night of Jesus' trial. Continues. Peter had to stay outside the gate. Then the disciple who knew the high priest spoke to the woman watching at the gate and she let Peter in. The woman asked Peter, Number one, you're not one of that man's disciples, are you? No, he said, I'm not. Because it was cold, the household servants and the guards had made a, what? Charcoal fire. They stood around it, warming them. Themselves. And Peter stood with them, warming himself. Go down to verse 25. Meanwhile, as Simon Peter was standing by the fire warming himself, they asked him again, question number two, you're not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, no, I'm not. But one of the household slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked third time, didn't I see you out there in the olive grove with Jesus again? Peter denied it. This charcoal fire in this story in John 21 reminded of Peter. Reminded Peter of the biggest failure that he would be remembered for forever. Three times he denied Jesus. Except this time, I wonder if he thought Jesus knew the details. I imagine as he swims up on shore and he sees the charcoal fire... And it starts to trigger the memories. He's wondering, man, since Jesus was on trial, did he know that I did all those things? Thanks. 
Nevertheless, in that passage, you know what we see? In John 18, we saw that Peter does what a lot of us do when it comes to our failures. You ever notice that our culture encourages us to hide? It's commonplace in America. We're all hiders. We hide from everything. The reason... You and I feel so guilty with our failure is because we are guilty. The only reason we can deal with our guilt is by admitting our guilt. Basically, all of us, whether insiders or outsiders, start out in identical conditions, which is to say that we all start out as sinners. Scripture leaves no doubt about it. There's nobody living right, not even one. Nobody who knows the score, nobody alert for God, they've all taken the wrong turn. They've all wandered down blind alleys. No one's living right. I can't find a single one. Their throats are gaping graves. Their tongues are slick as mudslides. Every word they speak is tinged with poison. They their mouths and pollute the air. They race for the honor center of the year. They litter the land with heartbreak and ruin. They don't know the first thing. About living with others. They never give God the time of day. This makes it clear, doesn't it? That whatever is written in these scriptures is not what God says about others to us to whom these scriptures were addressed in the first place. And it's clear enough, isn't it, that we're sinners, every one of us, in the same sinking boat with everyone else. The reason you feel guilty is because we are guilty. We're all about hiding. We live in a world where hiding is the standard. And the one thing about this God of the universe is that he'll allow us to hide. Think back to the Garden of Eden in the beginning. After Adam and Eve sinned, what did God do? He asked a question. A question with a sting. A question in which they had an opportunity to be up front and honest about their failure. God said, Adam, where are you? God doesn't lose things. It's one of the benefits of being all-knowing. He was asking a question to see if they'd admit their failure. Everyone in this room, we've got a problem with hiding. We come looking the part on Sundays. We act like we've got it together throughout the week. But we all know there are things that trigger our greatest failures. A diploma, a song, a location, an article of clothing, a baby. And in those moments that you see them, even though that happened years and years ago, you're eat up with guilt. It's exactly what's going on with Peter. Look how Jesus deals with it in John 21 verse 15. After breakfast... Jesus asked Simon Peter, and this is great, just the two of them get together. Jesus asked Simon Peter, and he says here, Simon, son of John. I think it's incredible that he uses Simon's old name. Meaning he's saying, hey, Simon, son of John, I know I called you and set you apart. I know that you followed me, but I want to set all that to the side. I want to ask you right now. I want to acknowledge who you are right this minute. The real you got a question. Do you love me? Simon, son of John, do you love me? And then he says more than these. The reason he says more than these, if you'll remember, Peter at one time, he was talking big and bad to God, making promises. He said, Lord, even though everyone else will fall back, I will stand strong. Just the two of them talking. Jesus says, Simon, do you love me? Jesus is being very vulnerable here. He's putting his heart on the line. So what do you mean? I'll tell it to you like this. Jenny and I, uh, we've been married now 12 years. Before we were married, dated seven years. I remember when we first started dating, we were watching White Fang. Anybody ever seen that movie? White Fang, great movie, Disney movie. 
And we were watching White Fang with some friends, and I remember holding Jenny's hands during that movie. I thought, like, man, this is going somewhere. Big time relationship. And because I'm an idiot guy, not long after the holding hands incident, I decided to tell Jenny I love her. I remember that night that I first told Jenny I love her. I put my heart on the line. I made myself vulnerable. I said, just want you to know, I love you. Followed by a long pause. As if she didn't hear it, I just added a little bit more to it. You know, a lot. Followed by a longer pause. I put my heart in the line. I was hoping she'd say, Tim, of, of all people, I'm in, so in love with you. It's your character, your charisma, your chip. This little abs, everything about you. But it would take months for her to communicate that back. I had put my heart on the line. We don't look past this passage of scripture without thinking, Jesus with Peter, he put his heart on the line. I noticed he didn't ask all these other questions. Peter, do you feel sorry? You promise you'll do better? You promise you'll try harder? Will you give more? Peter, did you pray a prayer a long time? No. He says, Peter, right now is what matters most. In light of all those failures that have just shown themselves to you throughout this passage, Peter, do you love me now? Right now it matters. Peter's response, verse 15, Yes, Lord, he replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus said. By the way, that's a great question to dwell on. I've dwelled on it quite a bit for the last few weeks. Just think about that. Just between you and Jesus, do you love me? Set aside your spouse, your job, your house, your kids, your material possessions, everything. Just you and him. Do you Of me right now? It's a great question. Peter replied, you know I love you, then feed my lambs, Jesus said. Verse 16, Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. And take care of my sheep. And I'm wondering if Peter's thinking, that's weird. He just asked me that question one time already. Maybe the waves were too loud here on the side of the shore. Maybe the disciples were talking. Talking too much. And he didn't hear my answer the first time. Verse 17. A third time, Jesus asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Look here. Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question the third time. You know what? Just think back to the charcoal fire in John 18. How many times did they ask him if he was a follower of Jesus? Three times. Peter thought he got away with that one. It resonated to him when he saw the charcoal fire, but now Jesus says, do you love me? One, do you love me? Two, do you love me? Three, all of a sudden Peter is eat up with failure. Look at his words. Verse 17, the second part, Peter said, Lord, you know everything. All that failure, all my sin. You know everything. And you know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. And that is why Jesus died. For your greatest failure. For my greatest amount of guilt. 
There's no such thing as cheap grace. And every time guilt raises its terrible head to haunt us, we have a tendency of dwelling on failure and guilt and regret. And Jesus says, listen, I just want you to pick yourself up. Do you love me? Then get the picture of grace and move forward. There's sheep to be fed. There's people that need to hear about me. All across this room, Jesus wants you to leave with one thing. I want you to think about your greatest failures. The things that no one else knows about. You know, it triggers every once in a while. Maybe it's at night before you go to bed. Maybe it's when you play that song, you get in the car, you see someone. It's just that thing that you think no one else knows about. I want you to know Jesus knows it. And the message is that he's communicating to you and to me today, that one thing is this. Ready? Failure isn't final. Forgiveness wasn't free. Failure isn't final. Forgiveness wasn't free. That's why Jesus Christ came to earth. He died upon the cross. He rose again from the dead. And he commu communicates that one simple message that failure isn't final. Forgiveness wasn't free all throughout God's word. And he has a special way of focusing in on it in John 21. You know, the neat thing is, that's the story throughout scripture. People that were scarred by guilt, scarred by embarrassment and failure. Look at Abraham. He lied. God used him. Look at Jacob. He lied. God used him. David had an adultery, had adultery, had an affair, murdered someone. God used him. Paul persecuted Christians. God used him. Peter. All those things that we talked about today, God used him. The nation of Israel turned their back on him over and over. God used him. Here's the message. Failure isn't final. Forgiveness wasn't free. There's no such thing as cheap grace. And when guilt haunts us, 